nobody else has. Okay. Uh, but I do know, Lil Birdie told me that you were particularly close to George Harrison, so yes. you might know this answer. Yes. Uh, is it true that George Harrison came over to America and remixed the White Album because he didn't like the EQ? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> he came over, we were working on the Jackie Lomax project, and George was very frustrated with the sound on the album, and so he remastered it. So this was not remixing each of the songs, but actually remastering the EQ on the overall album. And I was with him when he did it, yes. You were with yeah, him? Yeah, absolutely. Do you know I've never heard anyone give an answer to that? Yeah. You know, you know, and I've heard different versions of this, but I read these things, but I was there, you know. <laughs> And what, what was that like? Well, we didn't, I never would talk about being with the Beatles for 20 years. It was like, it was such a special place and I felt very privileged and they were very open with those of us that were in one of the inner circles. There were more than one inner circle, but um, we all felt so privileged that we had been invited in and they treated us so good. And it's not like everybody said, well, okay, let's make a pact. We won't talk about it. Right. We won't write about it. We just... For some reason, we all just decided not to, just out of respect for the privilege and, and how good they were to us. And then what's really interesting is like 40 years later, we're all writing about it. <laughs> and uh, it's very curious to think about that. And so we've talked with each other, a lot of us, and I think time has passed that there is no betrayals now in our stories because you know it's, it's, all, it's all past and all our remembrances now are much softer and much more mature. And Isn't we it see sad it under, yeah. that like today, you know Paul and John, all that would have been behind yeah. them, they may yeah. have gotten back together. Oh, there's no question about it, no question. You know, their, their relationship was so deep. And so, I'll give you an example, um, a real quick example is I was with Paul and um, we were in Beverly Hills and, and I had a private bungalow for him in the back of the Beverly Hills Hotel. And we had extra time and so Paul's sitting there and he's working on songs for the White Album. And so I'm sitting here with him, he said, well, what do you think about this? And I said, well, why don't you try this? And da da da, and we were working on Oobla Dee Oobla Dee, um, back to the USSR and uh, Blackbird. So I'm driving over Mulholland Drive that night, I went, wait a minute, was, was I just songwriting with Paul McCartney? You know? <laughs> So the record comes out and it says Lennon McCartney. Now I didn't expect it to say McCartney Mansfield, but you know I knew John wasn't there. Right. And that's why. And so I asked Paul. I said, "Well, you know, why isn't that just McCartney? Because John wasn't there." And he said, "John and I are such a part of each other, and we are so in sync and, and in tune with each other that, and we have written together so much. When I'm writing something, I can almost hear John saying, "No, no, no, let, let's let's do this instead." So he said, "In essence, we are writing." Together. That's so that's amazing. a pretty pretty close relationship that those two had. You know. Very tight. Yeah. Now you said you were there. Were you there when Paul cut the reggae version of Oh Blah Dee, Oh Blah Da? No, uh -uh. Okay, that's my favorite version yeah. of that. I have about 20 of them. Oh my gosh. So that's my... Wow. I have every outtake of that one. Okay. Um, and, and I like that one uh, a lot. Now... In the offices and uh, we, had, we had planned footage, uh, live footage for the film, Let It Be. And we kept getting, get, not getting it done, but it kept happening. And they hadn't played together live in years anyway. So um, we'd set up different ideas and it always fell through. And all of a sudden, we're basically out of time. So somebody said, we're going up on the roof. And uh, I'd come in from California. And it was January, late January, and freezing cold. We're going up on top of a six-story building in town, London. And all I have is like... California clothes because I never worried I'd get you know I'd walk off the plane get straight into a limo limo would take me to the hotel just straight into the hotel and then limo would take me over to the office so I was on the outside so I didn't worry that much about clothing and so I thought if I'm going to be on this roof I'm going to freeze my buns off you know so I run down the street and grab the first thing I can find and it's a it's a white top coat <laughs> and um, I get up on the roof, and but I didn't realize it was actually a raincoat, not a top coat, <laughs> and it just it was rubber, rubberized, so it just froze, and it, so it didn't really keep me warm. But everybody up there is wearing black that day, so in the you film, really the picture, stand out. You know, it's easy to spot me, even if it's fleeting. You know, I'm I'm there, so that part worked out good. And then after a while, I mean, you could have hosed me down with ice water, and I wouldn't have even noticed it because it was just so incredible that day. You know.
Was Phil Spector there at no, that time? No, was he around? No. Did you meet him in? I knew of Phil in L.A., but I never saw him over there. Okay, yeah. I won't go into the ugliness of what yeah. what's going on with him. Um, other than it's very sad. He's yeah. he's a musical genius yeah. and a very sick person, yeah. and we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Let, let, let's get into your book. How, how do you go from? Being the head of Capitol, being in, with Waylon and Jay, you know, you were in country music, yeah. and Waylon and Jesse are old yeah. friends of mine, Miriam. Yes, um, Miriam. You know, and and you've done all these things, and were you evolving spiritually? For instance, in the '60s when the Beatles went to yeah. uh, India, and with the Maharishi, and were into studying transcendental meditation. Was that a beginning point for you for spirituality, well, or what? What started leading you in the direction a of spirituality, and ultimately yeah. you deciding that Christianity was the answer? For right. You? What happened is my life fell apart, and like all of us, or not all of us, but most of us do, you know, the decadence and the bad choices and the drugs and everything else. And um, when I started hitting bottom, George had planted seeds in me a few years before. And it was a private conversation we had in the kitchen in the house that I'd gotten for him up in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, so, was it, if I may just interrupt, yeah. is that the house where he passed? No, no, okay. no, no. no. Right. This was just a, a rental, but it was a okay. big place with a pool. So um, he had planted the seeds, and so when I needed really needed some spiritual help, that was the reason I went into the whole guru thing. And I spent ten years doing that. You know. As a Hindu? No, as a. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you have everything you need in here? Oh yeah. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, um, I was asking it because uh, George was Hindu. Yeah, he was Hindu, but I was uh, I had a uh, a uh, Indian guru, and the things were pretty much mixed together, you know, <laughs> in that days. But it was the chanting and the meditating and the astral projecting and all the different kinds of things. And I was a teacher, and I was very advanced in my practices. A TM teacher? No, not a TM okay. teacher, just a meditation. I, I was the follower of a guru named Guru Rajananda, who was the founder of the International Foundation of Spiritual Unfoldment, which uh, expressed itself as the American Meditation Society, the British Meditation Society, uh, the Scandinavian Meditation. He was, a, he was mm -hmm. one of the major, major gurus mm -hmm. at the time. And I was like his favorite chela, and I did all mm -hmm. his teachings and things like that. But. Um, my life just really fell apart then, and so I was in L.A. and I'd lost everything, and, and my marriage had broken up, and my kids were gone, and so I thought I'm gonna just go back to Nashville, you know, where I'd had so much success with Waylon and Willie and the boys, and I thought I'll just go back there and just go crazy. I'll just get my old buddies together, and I called Tom Paul, and he said, "Yeah, you can land here in the studio," and I called David Frizzell at the time, who I'd been producing, and he said, "Yeah, you can stay at my house out here in the lake." So. I came out here and I was just going to get crazier and wilder and everything and I met a young lady right away and we fell in love immediately oh. and she was a very devout Christian and here I was a stoner and I had a guru and I was <laughs> broke and I had a bad rep, with, you know, <laughs> anyway. So we met but we fell in love and um, so we had a, about a three month battle and uh, she eventually brought me to the Lord. And, uh, did wait? Did Miriam? I, yeah. I always call Jesse Miriam yeah. because I'm Jewish, and she yeah. loves for me to use her yeah, Jewish yeah. name uh -huh. when I talk with her. Did yeah. what? Did did Jesse Coulter, yeah. whose real name is Miriam? Miriam. Yeah. Um, we titled that gospel did, album Miriam. Did okay. Yeah. So you yeah. worked with her on yeah. that. Did she talk to you at all about? Uh, Jesse would bring it up, but you know we were all so crazy and and. Um, we knew she was, but that didn't mean we had to be. Right. <laughs> and she would openly pray. And uh, first night after we had I'm Not Lisa as a, as a hit record, um, we were playing the Santa Monica City Auditorium. Waylon was headlining, and Commander Cody was, was on the program. And so we decided to have Jesse go out that night. And Jesse walked out her first performance, major performance in a, in a major auditorium. And she walked out, and she was all in white. And the lights were on her and she just glowed and she stopped at the piano stool and knelt down and prayed. And this was a hardcore stone That's rock Jesse. and roll crowd. That's Jesse. And I don't care how people felt about religion, it touched everybody. 
it was just gorgeous. And I just thought it took a lot of guts too. You know, she's but, a very genuine yeah, woman. Yeah, and then she she gets up and then mm -hmm. then then you know, it was it was a wonderful night. But he knew who I was, and we met in the middle of the ballroom at the Sheraton Hotel down on uh, Broadway mm -hmm. during a convention. Mm -hmm. And we met in the middle of the room. I was trying to get across the other side of people. And all of a sudden, Waylon and I are face to face. And it was like a crowd opened up, that opened up like two kids are going to get in a fist fight. And it, and it said, hi, um, I'm Candy's the young Waylon. And uh, that, uh, we started talking. And so I was producing an album of Holly. We'd just taken out a Buckman's band. And had a Waylon-esque sound. So I said, mm -hmm. um, who does your uh, arrangements, Waylon? And he goes, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I guess I do. <laughs> I said, well, would you, would you work with me on this album and arrange a couple songs? And we uh, did Queen and Silver Dollar. We had a, mm -hmm, a hit with yeah. that and then another hit. Didn't you do Amanda with him? I did Amanda. Yeah. I did, uh, did the complete Are You Ready for the Country album. Right. I okay. did... Um, um, the Neil Honky... Young cover, Are You Ready for the Country. Yeah, yeah, and then I yeah. did on Honky Tonk Heroes, I did the single off that. Uh, we had it all. And then on... Um, Ramblin' Man, I did Amanda, and It'll Be Her, and on uh, I've Always Been Crazy, I think that's the title. Yeah. I've Always Been Crazy, it keeps me from going insane. Yeah, and I did uh, I Walked the Line on that one. Mm -hmm. And then I did some other things that aren't in albums with Waylon. Four albums with Jesse, and two albums with Tom Paul, and I did one thing. So on you were with Blair. The Outlaws, it was great. We were, uh, we were inseparable for about, about five years. In fact, in Between Wyoming's a new book, almost 20% of the book is don't devoted to the time with Waylon and Jesse and the whole outlaw movement. It's a very... Uh, and, and back when country was country. Well, and it was real. I mean, we were the real deal. And the people, the crazy thing is they wanted us to be crazy. And they made us crazier because they wanted to like, and, and then I realized later, they didn't have the guts to do it, you know. So, <laughs> well, now, did so, you ever go to Austin, to Willie's studio oh, gosh, down yes. there and cut down in luck? I used to cut down there a lot. I cut yeah. uh, several Texas bands down mm -hmm. there and Willie would sing on them. And Willie asked me once to start a record label with him. But, you know, Willie is, is as lovable as he is. It's maybe not the, you he know, gets the these best ideas. Idea. Willie and my ex-husband are very good <laughs> friends. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you know Tex Cobb. Oh gosh, yeah. That's my ex-husband. Oh, okay. And so, um, yeah. they're very, Willie and Tex are very close. Well, I tell the story in, in the, the new book, um, Between Wyoming's. That yeah, my ex-husband may be in your book for all I know. I don't think he is, no. <laughs> but we were playing the Houston Astrodome with Willie and Waylon and Ricky Nelson and uh, Tammy Wise. It's a giant lineup. And we're really tired. It was the end of a tour, so we started to go out to the bus to go back to Nashville. We were done. It was the last day. And somebody came with an emergency to John Yersick and said, uh, they're closing down the Texas Opry House because they can't make a payment. And would you and Willie come in and, and do a, a benefit concert because we could make enough money to keep it open. So Waylon and Willie, they said, you know, well, okay. So now we, we both, Waylon, Willie and I get in Waylon's bus and all of the other guys got on Willie's bus and we head out for... Austin, and it's just like the cal the cavalry coming to save the you know it was right. just, just like out of a movie you know and here's Waylon and I and Willie were playing poker and and uh, <laughs> so we get over there and and um, we we were up all night so we slept all day and then we drove into the parking lot at the Texas Opera House and it just it was just crowded with people it was just crowded with people you know the two people and just cheering and and it was just like it was just the most incredible feeling in the world. And they did a concert like I've never seen. Oh. I mean, Willie's two and a half hour concert was a was like a pre warm up compared to what he did that night. And the place was so packed; it was just the parking lot was full. The place was full. We we made more money before this thing even started to save the place. So Waylon and I, we get back to Nashville, and we get a call right away, and they skipped with the money. Oh my God! The promoters did so. Oh my God! Here's these wise cowboys. You just don't fool Waylon and Willie and everybody, and we all got taken for a ride. Oof, that's not good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you one more Beatle question. Okay. Can you tell me anything about Paul, George, Ringo, or John without violating a personal inner circle confidence? Uh -huh. That isn't known to the rest of the world. Well, I think as a group, the thing that was neat is how nice and normal they all were as a group of guys. 
They were very, they were probably the easiest band I ever worked with. We would have meetings, these four rock stars, they were on time, they almost like they had their notepads, and we would discuss things very, very, uh, you know, pointedly and clearly and have our assignments. And to boil them down, Paul, to me, was the leader of the group. It seemed like everything we did was, was started with Paul, you know, Paul's idea, Paul's impetus and like that. And he was like uh, the most popular kid in high school. That was kind of the Paul McCartney. John was the mysterious one. You never kind of knew what you said, how he was, you know, processing it. And he was very, very curt with me a lot. And uh, he over to, or he'd send transatlantic cables. We didn't have faxes and stuff in those days. And he would cuss words on girls down the mail in the Capitol. He'd be like swearing at me, you know, wanting this done and wanting that done. And, and um, so after he died, I was having lunch in London with Ron Cass, who was the president of Apple, and Tony Bramwell and Neil Aspinall. And we were talking about the guys. Yeah, you know, I was close with everyone, but for some reason I never felt like I, I got it with John, you know, and, and Cass when he said, you're crazy. John's the one that liked you best. And it turns out that it was just his nature that he trusted me and he liked me that he, there was no baloney in it. He just talked to me straight about what he was feeling. So, you know, if he wanted something done and he was in a hurry and wanted me to get my butt going, you know, he, he would just talk to me like, a, like you know, how you don't, you don't soft soap everything. You don't say, everything. please, would, yeah. you mind, would you mind, it's, yeah. get and, me this, and yeah. And then I, then yeah. I realized he did, he would set, uh, write me letters and, and sign albums and send them to me personally and ask me to help him on the Zapple project. And, I, and then I kind of started putting the whole relationship. Okay, John, that's John. Uh, you know, John had, was extremely frustrated because later on he really was concerned with world hunger and, and these kind of causes and he thought his celebrity could, he could change the world and he found even as a Beatle he wasn't able to do what he wanted. So he get very frustrated. Ringo, easy guy, first time you meet him, your best friends, and you hang out, and Ringo, you know, spent all those years in LA. Now that he's sober, he's, a lot, he's, he's yeah, not nice to yeah. be around. He told, he told me once, he said, uh, now that I'm sober, he said, I play golf, I work out, I eat well, I do everything that I used to hate about other people, <laughs> you know. But uh, he and I hung out for years and years and years. Uh, we went through our different marriages and our downfalls together. And, so that was a relationship that carried on forever. And George's did too for quite a while. Do you and, still stay in touch with Paul and Ringo? And, uh, and Ringo, Ringo and I still share the same attorney, so, and uh, you know, um, but George was the one I had the real deep spiritual connection and just one of the- Well, he was such a spiritual person. Well, I mean, one of the nicest, most gentle men I've ever known in my life. And mm -hmm. it was like, I was supposed to be taking care of him, but it, it was more like he took care of me, you know, he'd, he, one night in London, because he knew how much pressure I was in, I hadn't any sleep because I'm flying back and forth. And we're late night in a meeting at the Apple Building. He said, come on. I said, what? He said, you're going home. You're going to bed. And he, he took me over to my hotel and virtually uh, took my shoes off and laid me up in bed and made sure I was He said, I'll cover for you. Don't worry. You know, that kind of, because he saw how tired I was. And he knew the pressure I was under that I couldn't like to say, hey, gang, I'm tired. I'm out of here. And by all accounts, he's such a yeah. gentle, he was yeah. a gentle yeah, soul. I love George. I, I know you're in a hurry because you've got to get on stage yeah, yeah. pretty soon. So very quickly, uh -huh. I want you to say anything you want to say about your book, your new book, because you've had a couple of others out, but your new book comes out June 11th. I'm putting this up not only on my site, but on YouTube. Okay, So right. this could possibly get Fantastic. thousands and thousands yeah. of hits. So why don't you talk about okay. why people... Yeah. Should buy the Beatles fans. <laughs> okay. That's how they're going to look well, at it because are, you're a Beatles fan. There are What's a couple book? new Beatles stories in in the Between Wyoming's. But Between Wyoming's is because you know the life I had. I mean, I produced everybody from Don Ho to David Cassie to Waylon Jennings to you know uh, just all kinds of and worked with all these incredible people over the years. Everybody from Judy Garland, to, you know. So um, I took the standpoint. Uh, in the old days, in the 60s, when we were hippies and stuff, we used to go try and find ourselves. So I thought, well, as this old guy, I'm going to go back across my life and find myself. Because I've never quite put all the pieces together, because everything was happening so big and so fast that it was like these giant moments. So uh, Connie and my wife, my wife and I, we get in a band, we named the band Moses. 
and uh, we do this metaphorical trip where I return to LA and I tell stories about it, Capitol, and with the stuff that we did in LA. The Magical and, Moses tour. Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> And uh, then we're driving along, and I'll hear a Glenn Campbell song as we're going across Arizona. I'll tell a story about me and Glenn Campbell. And then Connie falls asleep in the van. I'm going across the Arizona desert, and I'm having these conversations with God. And then we pull into Austin, and I tell a Waylon and Willie story about things, you know, like the thing I just told you a minute ago. And then we come to Nashville, and when I get to Nashville, I devote about a fourth of the book to, to all the things that happen with the whole outlaw movement and the Nashville thing. And then we leave there and we go to Connie's home where she was raised and then we just do a complete trip and then I decided when we get to Portland that, that I really got to go back to that roof, that day on the roof. And so I catch a plane and go to London and, and get up on the lonely old dirty roof and that's where I, I really, God and I really have the big conversation. Oh my god! And that's where I get everything settled together. I get a plane fly back, she picks me up at the Portland airport in Moses and we drive down the coast and live happily ever after. So oh. it's, a, it's a travelogue, it's a whole bunch of show business stories, and it's also a spiritual journey. And it's interspersed with these conversations with God and show business stories. And, 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 this, and this will be available June it, 11th? Today. It's available today? Is it available at Amazon.com? Yeah, it's already on Amazon. And uh, it's in all the bookstores too. Is there a website that you have that you would like people to uh, go to? Yeah. Um, and you don't know it. <laughs> I don't know it. Uh, so you know, look up Between Wyoming's on YouTube, mm -hmm. and there's the video. Uh, we, we took a video oh, okay, and stuff like that. And uh, Now you said Wyoming's or? Between Wyoming's is the name. Between Wyoming's is yeah. what people need to yeah. look up on yeah. YouTube. Okay. Okay. Are we're we done? Go. We're, do we're going to let you go now. Okay. <laughs> Pay no attention to that imposter that you saw in those videos a little earlier. It's really me. Right now, on tonight's shoe, we'd like to look some, some really, really excellent that's been drinking. <laughs> some really 